My name is Dmitry Nezov. I'm a medical geneticist at the uh, Oshner Clinic Foundation in New Orleans. And um, for many of you, you probably didn't hear what it is, but it's one of the major, actually the major healthcare provider in Louisiana and south part of Mississippi in the um, Gulf region. And uh, we have a main campus in New Orleans, and then we have a couple of other hospitals, and they're all over Louisiana. So uh, as a medical geneticist, I see many uh, patients with autism, whether they have genetic disorders or something that is still unidentified or developmental delays that have autistic features as a part of them, but there's no autism uh, or just uh, plain metabolic disorders. And I'll be talking about that today. And genetics of autism is quite a large uh, topic and is kind of growing exponentially as we go along. So I'll try to fit it all in the time allowed. And uh, Dr. Filka couldn't be here with me. She's a developmental pediatrician that works right, her office is right next to mine. And we frequently refer patients to one another. The other, uh, one of my colleagues is pediatric neurologist. There's actually two of them uh, who, uh, uh, on the other side. So there's no disclosures, there's no conflicts of interest to report. So uh, is uh, autism genetic? We've heard somewhat in a presentation, a keynote speaker this morning, talking about genetics, and I, I wish he spent more time on genetics, but then I said, no, let me uh, talk more about that. But I was, I was glad that he mentioned that. The figure that he gave there, and I'll talk about it more, is already different from the one that I... I'm giving you today, and it just, just kind of shows you that the science moves forward, and yesterday, or even this morning, there's something that was true for the morning that is not true for the afternoon. And uh, when we say, well, it's something genetic, uh, basically you need to see, the, first, the best model you can think of is identical twins. Well, they've got the same DNA by definition, if you've got the same condition in one, the other one should have the same condition too. And that's a matter of what we call concordance. Okay? So if you have a 100% chance of fragile X syndrome between the two identical twins, when we talk about, um, when we talk about autism, it's only 70% of identical twins will have autism. So one born with autism, the other one... 70% chance that he'll have autism as well. And then 5% of fraternal twins. So notice what I put the strict definition of autism. I don't think anybody today talked about it, but I will because it's very important for my purposes and for purposes of the entire, as a diagnosis and treatment and financial resources for us to know, well, what is autism really is and how many patients are diagnosed correctly and how many of them are overdiagnosed or underdiagnosed. Because strict definition probably took place about maybe 15, 20 years ago, DSM-3, Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Psychiatric Disorders, listed specific characteristics which mostly um, had averable patients who were doing lots of stereotypical behaviors, did not talk, did not look, did, had their own world, were rocking in the chair, and had high pain threshold, and did not really talk to you. That is a strict definition of autism that was used in DSM-3. Then as DSM-4 and DSM-5 now came out, the conditions and the... Um, definition got broadened, and now we have autistic spectrum disorder, ASD. We also have pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise uh, uh, specified. And some of you probably have either patients or uh, children or students who are listed as mild autistic spectrum or PDD, pervasive developmental disorder, or just autism. And you're probably wondering why, why and how is it is it really the degree is correlated to if you autism, you're the most severe, then pervasive developmental disorder is least severe? Well, it turns out it's more complicated than that. And in genetics, you can see that whenever you broaden the definition, now more people will fall into it. And now you have 90% of identical twin, 
90% chance that that identical twin will have autism if there is one who has autism already. 10% of fraternal twins. So you have from 70 to 90% jump, from 5 to 10% jump. And this morning, the figure was given of not 10%, but 20% of fraternal twins. This morning, I read the most recent articles in Archives of General Psychiatry, which says that with the fraternal twins, there is a possibility of 30%. So if one has autism, the other one has 30% chance of having autism. That's a very high figure. Different from this one, so there's these estimates now that are coming out every day virtually. And why is that? Well, that's because there are genetic and environmental components. As a geneticist, I always embrace and welcome the talk about environment because guess what? That alters genetics. There's no question about it. When does that start? It starts preconceptually. I hear everyone saying, oh, you know, even before birth, prenatally, during the pregnancy. No, it's not even after conception. It's preconception. It's the sperm and the egg. That's what makes the germline of the offspring because that's what's going to get fertilized and going to make the genetic material of the child. So whatever happens to the sperm and to the egg that was there before the child was conceived is going to be altering the child's future. Now you could tell that as a geneticist, I'm probably more paranoid than anybody else. I have my own two children, and I was paranoid, especially with the second one, of what's going to happen, because really a lot of things can change. But the fact that your identical twins don't have 100% concordance means it's not just genetic. There is also environment. If one twin has fragile X, the other one will have fragile X 100%. If one identical twin has Down syndrome, the other one will have Down syndrome 100%. Autism is not that way. Because it's more complex. Because it's not just genetic. So uh, the incidence of autism has been reported anywhere between 1 in 150, the most recent data was 1 in 92. I think this morning the data was 1 in 66, 1 in 166. And depending on the study, it's really hard to say exactly, but we know that it's increased. It's increased over the past decade, and I don't have to tell you that. But then I just told you about broadened diagnostic spectrum. So it's almost like think about it this way. Um, Do you agree that there's more developmentally delayed children in general than autistic children. I mean, developmentally delayed, the um, rate of mental retardation uh, in the general population is 2 to 3 percent, so that would make it about 1 in 30, 1 in 25. And we are saying now, well, by the highest estimates, autism is 1 in 92. So if you place all developmentally delayed kids in the autism spectrum, and you can easily do that, because some of them would have autistic features, but they may not satisfy the strict criteria. They'll satisfy the autistic spectrum criteria. And that's when the parents are wondering, well, why is my child so different from the other one, even though we, all, we both have diagnosis of autism? So it's the broadened diagnostic spectrum that improved the ability to evaluate. I mean, the more we hear about it, the more we pay attention to it, and the more we pick them up, but are there going to be over diagnoses? Um, I did not have a chance to ask him the question, uh, this morning speaker, but you know, that pediatric study where they recommended, this is a guideline now for all pediatricians to evaluate children between 18 months and 24 months of age for signs of autism, uh, it is a great thing to detect the child before he starts developing symptoms, ideally, or just at the brink of developing symptoms because the treatment is going to be more effective. But what about children who are going to be detected and don't have autism but just have developmental autistic features that would go away? Are we going to run into a lot of false positives? Are we going to run into the overdiagnosis? This is something I've been struggling with. Um, 
almost my entire career because I got diagnostic. I got autistic patients with a diagnostic of autism that really don't. I mean, if a child with autism comes in, sits on your lap, looks in your eyes, and plays with you, and is that child really autistic? And then there are other considerations. Heightened awareness, just talked about it. Incentives. I don't have to tell you about this. School resources, insurance companies. Um, if the child just has the elemental delay, at least in our state, you're not going to qualify for skill school resources. It's going to be much harder. You're going to have to be really, really delayed because otherwise, you're not going to get special aid. You're not going to have special tutoring and therapies inside the school. As long as you get autism, whenever you get autism diagnosis, you're going to get school resources. And insurance, there's... In Louisiana, we have $36,000 per year, $144,000 per lifetime maximum of the mandate, of the state mandate, for the insurance to cover uh, treatments for children with autism, such as applied, applied behavioral analysis. So these kinds of things drive that number up. And I would say to the parent, well, you know, uh, really, do you really think, <clears throat> do you really think that you research, do you really think that the child has autism? Because I'm not going to take that diagnosis away because I know that the child will immediately lose all the school resources. So I'm not going to take it away, but are you really scared? Are you really concerned? Are you not sleeping ni overnight? And you're not thinking that my child is going to be incurable if your child really doesn't have autism, but just swinging around or spinning around or closing the door, switching the light, and that's going to just go away. Those are stimming behaviors that are normal for any typical, typically developing child, including my own children. So, uh, so those are kind of things that are important for me to know because then I will classify them in a different category and look for different genetic causes or sometimes not look for any causes and say, come back in three months. Let's see how your child does. It's hard for pediatricians because pediatricians, a lot of times the families come in to me and say, well, our pediatrician just keeps kind of blowing us off and saying, you know, oh, it's okay, you know, the child will, your child just a little bit behind, but he'll start talking and don't worry about it, doesn't look in the eyes, it will go away. It's hard for the pediatricians truly to be objective all the time because um, I would rather err on the side of caution and say, no, we, want, we do not want to miss any child who could develop autism or already is in the first stages of it. On the other hand, what about the nightmares that it would create if it wasn't a diagnosis of autism and if it was false positive? What, do we think about those kind of scenarios? It is hard for pediatricians. That's why they're trying to be more in the middle, and I wonder that screening between 18 months and two years of age, how much more complexity that would add to that um, problem. And just kind of to illustrate, this is an international journal of epidemiology recently, and uh, it, it diagnostic change and the increased prevalence of autism, and basically looked at uh, the prevalence of autism in California between 1995 and 2005, and uh, other uh, changes in diagnostic practices now. And 26.4% of the increased autism caseload in California resulted from diagnostic change, and that's basically just from loosening those criteria. 631 patients with mental retardation out of 7,000 got diagnosis of autism. So in other words, you have a child with a mental delay, you just had the mental delay, then the, the criteria loosened, and the child got into the autistic spectrum category. And that's where the prevalence figures go higher. Does that make sense? So that's, that's what makes it, this contributes to those numbers where people say, uh, people pro after or pro against vaccination are saying, well, we look at the autism continues to rise all this time without really mentioning, well, how do we define autism in the first place? So there is a myth. Autism is a causative diagnosis. I just want you to understand because for my purposes, very uh, important. 
causative diagnosis is the one where you made, so for example, the child has dysmorphic features, developmental delay, heart disease, we've got the chromosomal analysis, there's Down syndrome. Down syndrome is a causative diagnosis. Developmental delay is descriptive diagnosis. And that's what autism is. It is a descriptive diagnosis, okay? It is a true diagnosis. There is a code for it, ICD-9 code that I use to bill every day. But it doesn't tell you a single anything about the ideology of that autism. Well, what caused it? And so many autistic children, adults, that have different ideology. Well, that is where I come in and I say, let's find at least some cause that we can prove. We can prove by directly testing the DNA. We cannot prove the environmental effect. Because if, the one, if one mother had really bad control, badly controlled diabetes during pregnancy, her child has a higher risk of malformations and down the line developmental problems, but there are lots of mothers who had badly controlled diabetes who had normal children. So how does the diabetes control, how does diabetes affect the part of the fetus, the body of the fetus, or the brain, we cannot tell. We cannot quantify that. All the data that would say, well, how, what are her sugars during the pregnancy? What is hemoglobin A1C? What are her glucagon and epinephrine level? Nothing is correlated with the outcome. The DNA test, we can say there's extra 30, there's extra chromosome 21. That's Down syndrome. There is an uh, expanded trinucleotide repeat on X chromosome. That's fragile X. Until proven otherwise. It doesn't matter which environmental effect is out there. Environmental effect can make it better or worse. But that's the ideology. So the, I propose as a genetic kind of concept is that autism is a result of particular genetic defect. That would be a causative diagnosis then we'll be able to separate different children into why is it that one autistic child is so much different from the other one. Why is it important to get the true diagnosis? So a lot of kids come in to me and say, well, they autism or autistic spectrum or PDD, and that's the end of it. And that's good in the sense of therapies. We're doing therapies. We do school resources. We do all the wonderful things that have been described today. And I have myself learned a lot of those things that I will apply on my patients and tell Dr. Filco to apply them. But what about other risks? Well, autism may come with something else. It may be part of the syndrome. And the syndrome may say the child may have hypercalcemia, not in the baseline state, but in a stressed state, calcium can actually fall down in case of DeGeorge syndrome, for example, where there's a chromosome 22 deletion. Or uh, there's immunodeficiency that is particular for certain that you really don't know about until you test for it. How many autistic children are tested for immunodeficiency? There are some, primarily because parents ask for it, because parents have learned on the Internet somewhere that immune system is affected in children with autism. Well, how come not all of them? How about just a few? Could there be that genetic is the one that is different in this child versus the other child? The outcome is autism. And even those behavioral characteristics, you know, and I know I've, I've been present, Dr. Filco, when she evaluates the child with autism, First, she gets, uh, first, she has two appointments. One is with the parents where she does CARS questionnaire that is based strictly on parental observation. And then she rates that and says, well, this is more, um, highly likely or less likely or moderately that is autism. Then she sees the child and she does what's called autism diagnostic observation schedule or ADOS where she actually presents the child with various different stimuli and she and sees how the child responds and that is also gradation highly likely highly unlikely there's nothing that says autism or no autism there are so many gray areas there 
Well, there's many patients who are at the a high spectrum or the lowest spectrum. There are some patients who do really well with the therapies and others don't. What, what predicts that? Do we just treat them and then see how they respond? Or do we maybe, as a part of the diagnosis, find what they have, treat the cause, and maybe that will be more efficient and result in much less agony of the family and the parents and everybody, including the child. So, there can be various organs and systems that can be affected in genetic syndrome that has autism, the other child that doesn't have genetic uh, syndrome and just has unknown cause autism. And it's also important to prevent those from happening. So you can prevent the complications, uh, uh, such as hypocalcemia, immunodeficiency of any bad infection, before they come in, if you know the true diagnosis. And then a recurrence risk estimate. How many of you who are parents thought, well, after the child that they have that has autism, I don't want to have any more children. I'm too afraid to have a child. Because somebody told me it's 100% risk. The other one has told me 75% risk. Some parents, as I, I told, really magic some kind of outrageous numbers that don't exist. 100%, 75%, 50%. Where, where are those taught? Where are those taken? Well, if you find genetic etiology, you can find exact recurrence risk. If it's a chromosomal deletion, which I'll show you down the line, that it is in the child that I've tested the parents and both of them don't have it, that's low recurrence risk, below 1%. That's something that's happened in the child and does not predispose the parents to have more risk for the next child to have it. On the other hand, if you have some autosomal recessive disorder or you have something that is also in the parent, just have milder manifestations, we can test the parent and we can say, okay, this, your risk is 25%, and guess what? We can give you prenatal diagnosis options. And those are, if you want to know before you have a child uh, uh, down the line, then you can predict with accuracy of 100% say that the child will not have autism from that particular problem that was found in a sibling. So those are traditional chorionic villus sampling and amniocentesis, but those are during the pregnancy, but then there was pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. It's before the mother gets ever pregnant, she finds out whether the child is at risk. And some of those things, for some, especially in Louisiana, in the Bible Belt, they are not going to take any of those options. But in, for others, uh, chorionic villus sampling, amniocentesis may not be acceptable, but preimplantation genetic diagnosis is. And they want to have options. They want to have options given to them. Uh, it's uh, unfortunate that some of my families who come in who just have one child who has autism opted not to have another child in fear of having autism in that other child. And then I find that the recurrence risk is low, then they go on to proceed to have another child. Or they decided still to keep all the resources to the child who has autism. But we all know that if you have low recurrence risk, that if you have a typical sibling who is not too far off in age, it's only good for the autistic child to have a sibling typically developing for the child's development. So there are short changing, and a lot, of, a lot of times people don't think about these things until you kind of put it out there and give them options. Of course, sometimes they also tell me, you just gave us a headache because we thought it was easier than this, but now you give us all these options and we don't know what to, do, what to decide. You decide, and I'm like, well, you know, if I need to be in your position, and this is just my uh, help to you, and you have to decide. And, of course, it can have a significant effect on the treatment. And we'll go over that. So some of the testing, uh, you probably all heard about microarray um, as a chromosomal testing. It used to be karyotype or fish fluorescent in cytohybridization, hybridization, which uh, turned out a terribly insensitive. They are uh, missing uh, an order of magnitude 
of abnormalities in the chromosomes that were able to be picked up by microarray. We revised all the figures. We said, oh, well, you know, we have about 5 to 10 percent uh, that all uh, cases of developmental delay are picked up by chromosomes. But probably less than 1 percent because we didn't have anything to compare. And then we came up with a new technology that is microarray, and we're diagnosing so many more of the patients with autism, developmental delay, or congenital anomalies, birth defects, but specifically with autism, that are very small, tiny sometimes deletions or duplications, but what they do is they uh, involve the gene that is um, important for brain development. And that gene alone could predispose you to have autism not necessarily cause autism, because autism is caused by the variety of factors. We are talking about the risk. So fragile X, single genes, metabolic. You've heard some of those before, and I'll talk more about metabolic later. So if you look at the past, we had this karyotype. We had first subtelomeric fish. It's the fish to the tips of the chromosomes, and then the uh, separate regions and you literally had to fish for a certain particular region because otherwise you wouldn't be able to do it and fragile X and single genes and now karyotype and fish has actually gone away and all we have is microarray fragile X and in some cases single genes and metabolic so this is much more sensitive much faster and actually less expensive even though microarray originally was more expensive, now the workup actually costs much less than it was before, and the workup has much more sensitivity than it was before. And all is done by blood. And actually, there are also some labs now that are working on the buckle swab to do DNA tests on buckle swabs. And there's the causes, and chromosomal probably will continue to rise. So depending on the study, 15 to 25 percent, and fragile X is just a fraction. You've got single genes, metabolic, and then I put down there mitochondrial, 10 to 20 percent, and I'll explain to you more what that means. Uh, so all in all, it's about 50 to 60 percent of all autism we can diagnose and get genetic cause or genetic predisposition. So still small number but significant number. Those are the kids that we can make an even more profound difference in addition to what we're already making. This is just one of the so-called breather slides. You know, this is a um, painting by one of the children with autism. So uh, when you look at some chromosomal tests, so these are the siblings, okay? 23-year-old sister, 25-year-old brother, all their lives, they were walking out, so IQ is 41, IQ is 34, so they're in a moderate uh, range. And all their lives, they were without diagnosis because all that could be offered is a karyotype of fragile X, which was normal. And uh, they both uh, have some degrees of autism. And uh, the, the girl has, the sister has cardiac defect, and uh, the brother has large testicles, while, you know, fragile X was still negative. Uh, now we actually know that the fragile X test that we're doing is 99% sensitive, but there is a 1% that we can test now is what's called fMR1 gene sequencing. In some of those cases where I was sure there was fragile X, but fragile X testing was negative, well, that was what we thought was a ruling out kind of testing. Now no longer. We can actually test an extra one for Fragile X. So microarray revealed chromosome 11 deletion and chromosome 4 duplication. So what does that mean? This is siblings. Those are chromosomes. And uh, you can see that this one is 4 and this one is 11. And the red tip is the one that they have as a duplication. So that segment of chromosome 4 is an extra. And then on the chromosome 11, you can see that that... Um, piece right here is missing, so there is a deletion. Turned out that their father actually had what's called reciprocal balance translocation, which he, um, met between his chromosome 4 and 11, switch occurred. So there was no problem in him because all the chromosomal segments are there and he is fine. 
but because of the segregation, you had uh, now an extra chromosome for tip and then uh, a part of the chromosome 11 that is missing, and you can see it there. And just from that, you can have what's called Jacobson syndrome that gives you uh, predisposition to autism, to mental delay, mental retardation, uh, cardiac defects, um, and thrombocytopenia and platelet dysfunction. So they were bleeding, they were bruising all their lives, and fortunately it didn't uh, come out to be that they were bleeding to the point that they were close to dying, but they could have. And if we knew that their chromosome 11 is deleted and they have Jacobson syndrome, we would have prevented this by just knowing that we just need to measure platelets before surgeries, for example, or just give platelets, platelet infusion immediately after there is some bleeding that occurred. And uh, the extra copy of four also has some brain genes on it, and some of the delays are coming from, that, from those genes. But the FGFR3, which is a gene that extra copy of it gives overgrowth, and they're actually very large. I mean, like, she's six foot and, she's, and he's 6.3. So um, that explains that. So the mother was kind of relieved to know that there was actually a problem, that there's chromosomal problem. And there's this effect also. I have a 25-year-old um, who has multiple anomalies and who uh, is averable at 25. He's very short um, and is autistic. And uh, also nobody could give him a, an answer. And when I applied microarray, uh, he had a chromosome 1 deletion that was large enough to explain all his problems and then tested the parents and none of them were positive for it. So that was something at De Novo. The mother was sitting in my office and crying. Finally, somebody gave me an answer. I did not know. Maybe it was something that I did. So even if you have a 25-year-old who you know that is not going to have a dramatic improvement, and even if you know that you've put so much love and so much care and gave them everything to the child, and by God, she done so much for this child, you still are wondering, well, what is it that I've done wrong? Maybe during the pregnancy, maybe after. At least this is a consolation for uh, the diagnosis of consolation. This is another pair of siblings. Again, um, nobody knew why he's uh, this brother here on the on your left uh, is a 20-year-old, has IQ in a mild range and um, autism, and also has cardiac arrhythmia, uh, interestingly enough, and that's, that's not likely, especially the type that they had. And then his 22-year-old brother actually had IQ of 25, but he probably would have been closer to 63 uh, as his brother is. He just had hypoxic encephalopathy. His pacemaker, both of them require cardiac pacemakers, to, um, you know, to prevent the arrhythmia from going lethal. And uh, he, one of his surgeries just ended up infected pacemaker and resulted in just overwhelming sepsis, and he uh, went into coma. And as a result, he was very severely affected. But for, all, for that so-called environmental factor right there. But this brother here was a pretty decent functioning and microarray revealed a very small chromosome 2 deletion. And that was just enough to involve NRXN1 gene. Now it's a well-known autism susceptibility gene um, on chromosome 2. And it uh, encodes for protein called neurexins. And they're important for cell-to-cell -cell neural and neuron communication. Uh, and um, it, it's uh, involved in autism, mental retardation, or heart there's also a subclass of it that uh, deals with heart, and that's why the cardiac arrhythmia. So that's another interesting lady. She's 21-year-old. She has autism, and um, she's probably in a mild range, um, and she had congenital deafness. And she has deaf brother as well from the same parents. So karyotype fragile X were normal. They also didn't know. She has a pretty you know, typical facial features. So microarray revealed uh, a de novo. So de novo means something that happened just in her duplication of chromosome 1. And that was in the locus 
which is well known to be associated with autism. And many patients have now been described. It's about 30 genes, and some of them are important in uh, brain development. And then it turned out that she had also a deletion in chromosome 13, which was also revealed by microarray. And it was a really small one. It was inherited from the father, who didn't know anything about it, because all it did was involved GJB6, which is a hearing gene. But if you break one copy of the hearing gene, it doesn't do you any harm because you have to break two copies. It's a recessive disorder, like cystic fibrosis, for example. You have to be, both parents have to be carriers, and the child will have 25% chance of having uh, cystic fibrosis. So the same thing here. Father didn't know. And then it turns out that the mother had a GJB2, which is another hearing gene, deletion. And the girl inherited both. So just look at, she inherited this from the dad, and she inherited this from the mom. And she's got what's called digenic hearing loss, which is autosomal recessive, and that's why she had deaf brother. Because the parents had 25% chance of having another child who is deaf. So uh, that was obviously her brother was like 18. Uh, so brother's three, three years younger. Those kinds of things would have at least helped the parents know, well, what are the options? Because they had no idea. Everybody ascribed deafness to autism. It really wasn't. This is deafness from something completely unrelated to what caused autism in her place, in her case. By the way, if you're all confused, just let me know because, you know, I'm kind of have to, yeah. Yeah, just, just a small part. Okay. Yeah, so you can't live with, a, yeah, you can't live without the whole chromosome being deleted. The only example of that is Turner syndrome, where you don't have one X or one Y, but that's just strictly for the sex chromosomes. In autosomal, uh, 1 through 22 pair, you cannot have one chromosome deletion. That's incompatible with life. And all of these 1B21 duplication and 13Q12 deletion, that's, those are actually the loci of the chromosomes that are deleted. I did not put how many kilobase pairs or megabase pairs. Just, you know, I have already enough of the information that I'm giving out, but they're small. So this is a 10-year-old. Uh, he uh, had autism and uh, mild range um, MR, uh, and he had short stature as well. You can see that his uh, head is actually large. Um, so the microarray actually revealed, this is called 15Q11.2 deletion. This is a deletion of chromosome 15, again, a very small one, in the autism susceptibility locus that has, again, been described in many different patients. Turned out that his father had it too. Father didn't, was not autistic, but by, by those standards back then, he's like 33 or 34-year-old, he didn't have autism. I mean, he wasn't strictly autistic. He also is not strictly autistic, just in an autism spectrum. But he had learning disabilities. He had to have special resource. He had to repeat several classes. He didn't finish high school. But he's a fully functional individual. He works, um, you know, and he's able to support himself and be independent. But... That is kind of deletion then is going to have 50-50 chance of being transferred to your child. Because you're either going to give deleted chromosome 15 or you're going to give normal chromosome 15. So it's a 50-50 chance every pregnancy. And I already kind of called them and said, you know, let's come in and do the follow-up appointment. So I wanted to counsel them on what this means. And then Fragile X came back. And it turned out that he had fragile X, too. Uh, so, um, because it usually comes back a little bit later than microarray. And that's why now it made sense that his, you can see his, his face is kind of long and his uh, chin is kind of pointed. Uh, and his ears are large uh, and his head is big. 
and they're also saying, you know, large testicles, but that's only post-pubertal. So he's 10 years old. And that's why it was really, to me, it was kind of hard, it was strange for me in the sense that uh, you can usually see when you're diagnosed with mental retardation at the age of 10, usually the IQ scores, you know, people are saying that they kind of, if you do six or seven years old, the IQ, it tends to be representative all your life. So at this age, he was diagnosed, he was pretty low functioning. And for chromosome 15 deletion, that's too low functioning, and that made sense because he's got fragile X on top of that, and fragile X typically have moderate to severe. And that was maternal. Maternal, the mother actually has the same number of repeats, and the, the way it works for fragile X is you cannot just get fragile X and the mother has normal FMR1, the trinucleotide repeat. The mother has to have at least a pre-mutation, and then it expands in the son. Well, the mother did not have a pre-mutation. She had a full mutation. And she had fragile X as well. But because she's a female, she has a milder manifestations of it. But she always depended on either her parents or a man that she lived with. So uh, some of that dynamic. And there's another twist just so that you didn't have, in, like he didn't have enough. He had 14-year-old sister from the same parents was absolutely typical, developmentally normal. She's in regular class, doing well. And she turned out to have 15Q deletion. And there's where we come to the concept of incomplete penetrance or variable expressivity. And that's when I meant that when you have a genetic problem, it doesn't necessarily cause autism. It can predispose you to autism and then something environmental that has to come in to trigger it. In the sister, nothing like that happens. She doesn't have fragile X. Or maybe she had better pregnancy when she had her than when she had him. And as a result, the sister carries the deletion, but she's totally fine. Guess what? When she has a child, she has 50-50 chance of passing it on to the child, and there lies a risk of autism. And then there are also prenatal diagnostic options. And the good thing was, she was negative for fragile X. She got a good X from her mother. So basically, her counseling to her, because she was coming to all the sessions, she was very bright and she was wondering, well, how will that impact her? She's 14 years old, but she was also already thinking, well, what is it going to be in the future? didn't have a boyfriend or anything at that time. But, um, and that's what I could tell her, that you are most likely not going to have a child who is as severely impaired as your brother because you don't have fragile X that he has and that your mother has. But you're still at risk of having a child more mildly affected like your dad. And that's kind of one of those things at which at least you have something to chew on rather than, okay, well, what... The, what, what is it that is out there that I am faced? This is an interesting uh, girl because she's 13-year-old. She has Down syndrome, trisomy 21. You can tell, right? But the problem is that in addition to congenital heart disease, she is also essentially a verbal. And she has severe mental retardation and she has autism. That's very unusual for Down syndrome kids because they usually are non-autistic. They're very social. They're, they're very happy. They're coming to you. They're talking to you. They, um, and they also can talk in full sentences usually. Their, their speech is limited, but it's very unusual that they would have no speech. Well, we, you know, in medical school we all learn, um, don't try to give two diagnoses to the same patient. Except that there's a lot of exceptions from the rule, and microarray helped us get those exceptions, just like the autistic uh, girl who is deaf. No, not related. It's two different things that are going on. This girl here, I ran microarray on her. She has 15Q1, 1.2 deletion. So in addition to trisomy 21, that is a completely random event, her mother was 36 at the time of pregnancy, so there was advanced maternal age effect. 
Her mother was the one that carried 15Q, and her mother was completely fine. And how do the trisomy 21 interact with 15Q11? Well, that's how, at least that's one of the predisposing factors. She didn't have anything else to explain why she is a verbal and she has autism. There's no, uh, she didn't have cardiopulmonary arrest, she didn't have coma, she didn't have any of that nature. Well, it's an interaction between these two at the epigenetic level. So above the DNA. Yes? Well, what we know now is I can't guarantee that this deletion played any role. I cannot guarantee it, no. I can guarantee that this caused Down syndrome. I can guarantee Fragile X caused Fragile X. But this is something that when you deal with incomplete penetrance, that's a very common concept in genetics because... We used to think, you've got the gene, you've got the disease. Well, that doesn't work like that. Because a lot of times you have the gene, you don't have the disease. Something else has to trigger it. But you do have predisposition. Remember that this is a deletion on one chromosome 15. There's another one. There's 15 that is a second copy that comes from another parent. Okay? The deletion came from mom. Dad gave her normal 15. And the set of the genes is the same on each chromosome. So there is a, uh, one of the um, thoughts currently is that the small deletions, they may involve these genes that are important for brain development. They are essential but not necessary. How come there are deletions in total population? Uh, there is an estimate that about one in a thousand has... Uh, and that's by conventional methods because microarray has not been applied yet for the general population. Um, I would predict met much more than that. And a lot of them are silent. And a lot of them um, also are what we call the, they fall on a recessive gene because if you have one copy that is normal and the other one is deleted, as long as the other genes are functioning, this one is going to be silent but if there was some trigger event that happened that somehow damaged that other chromosome 15, you're going to have that double hit kind of hypothesis. That person is going to be at a higher risk to develop autism if they live under the same conditions. They live in a big metropolitan polluted area with a lot of exhaust and smoking and things like that. Well, that person has a higher chance because he has predisposition or the pregnancy. If, if the pregnancy in one child, um, it was the mother that had the same mother had pregnancy with gestational diabetes or without gestational diabetes, with secondhand smoking or firsthand smoking or drugs or medications, and I wouldn't believe, you, I couldn't even stop telling you how many women uh, come and uh, tell me the medications that they're on during pregnancy that really nobody told them that they are actually potentially teratogenic. And they didn't know. And then a lot of uh, women also don't know the simple fact that when you find out that you're pregnant, it's already five to six weeks into the pregnancy. And if you just had binge drinking last night, you affected the fetus. That's the first trimester. Um, and... The, those kind of things are elicited during the history and you're trying to see, well, what is the risk and what is not. I don't know exactly if the alcohol was triggering this kind of deletion, for example, but I just know that could have been the factor. Not necessarily, at any point, at any point. Okay, so that's a tough concept to digest. It can start preconceptually. 
Yeah, I know. It's hard to it's it's hard to say. You you see how many possibilities there are. Well, yeah, but if it if it depends on what symptoms there are, it depends on what symptoms they are. So, like you say, her mother is like 48 or 49 years old right now. She had this deletion. She had no idea that she had it. There was no right or wrong number. Right. Right. Well, it's. No, no, because adult brain is, is already developed. Uh, no, we're talking about much earlier than that. Usually it's between conception, first trimester is one of the most important ones, and then the first two to three years of life where the, the development of brain is the highest, the most extensive. But then, of course, if it happens at four or five, it could potentially, but the risk is less. And how much less, nobody could tell you, at least at this point. I mean, we, we're just learning. But not at the age of 48 or 49, obviously. That's exactly right. And that's something that I, as a doctor, do not uh, kind of throw back at people and say, no, they're all safe. I don't, because I think that there is something to giving five, five, six different bugs or antigens at the same time could overwhelm the immune system. And there's where we're going to go to mitochondrial disease. If anybody's still able to, to listen. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's see. We have a little time, so I'll just uh, skip through this. Um, just give you a good, a good just illustration. This child here is five years old when he came to see me. A verbal does not understand anything that is said. Uh, he walks but with a toxic gait, so-called puppet-like gait. He has microcephaly seizures, absence of, pe of speech. He's got Angelman syndrome. So the mother uh, and the father both, they had um, a um, seven-year-old daughter and a five-year-old son, and they were afraid to have children. Because he, and I diagnosed him for the first time with Angelman, and the mother was wondering, well, what is going to happen? And unfortunately, this is the kind of syndrome that does not get better. I mean, they, it has a very severe, it's a gene that is very important in the brain to the point that it causes those uh, kind of problems. And usually it doesn't recur. The, the, that usually... Um, the recurrence risk would be low, except that I started, I started to investigate and basically found that she had a mutation in the gene that causes it, UBE3A, that was unreported before, but then by testing her sister, uh, I mean, by testing his sister and then his grandparents and then ruling out other genes and ruling out chromosomal problems, we basically came to the conclusion that the mother carrying that gene will have a 50% risk of having another child with Angelman. And that's something that you can now offer the prenatal diagnosis. This is some, if nothing else, Angelman syndrome is a good illustration of what the parents want to know, what recurrence risk is. This is a lifelong disorder that um, not a single recorded case ever was able to speak and ever was able to function just very happy faces and very inappropriate laughter. And the parents want to know that. The parents want to know, well, will I bring another child? Or do I have a choice to make sure I don't? And there are choices because that's where the diagnosis lies. So 50% recurrence. So mitochondria is especially dear to me because I think that that's the group of uh, children I can make most difference in. And uh, it's very under-recognized in children with uh, autism spectrum disorder uh, because not a lot of doctors think about it. And a lot of doctors think that it's actually the mitochondria, very severe disorders. If the child is running around and being hyperactive, 
usually that's not mitochondrial because they usually are in a wheelchair, drooling, seizing, and doing nothing. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Okay? So it kind of makes sense that mitochondria, what they do is they're a cellular energy factory. There's energy factories in the cell. They produce ATP. And um, ATP is like gas for the car. You know, your car is not going to run without a gas, but it also, uh, what if the gas is a uh, bad quality, then your car is not going to run or going to run but very poorly. And it's a very complex process. I'm not going to go into it. But there are studies that put uh, mitochondrial causes of autism at 7% and others at 65%. In my, in my experience, it's 20 to 25 percent. Uh, two weeks ago, I came back from the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation meeting in Chicago, and the consensus there was about that uh, percentage, and uh, lots of autistic spectrum disorders have mitochondrial component. So, uh, and this is just something that is only uh, for, it's only characteristic of mitochondrial because if you have good mitochondria um, and if you have mitochondrial disease, you don't have it everywhere. You're bound to have some good and some bad mitochondria. And heteroplasmia refers to uneven, uneven distribution of the bad mitochondria. So you can have most of the bad mitochondria in the brain and have most of the problems from the brain, or you can have most of them in the heart, you can have cardiomyopathy, most of them in the GI tract, you can have constipation, diarrhea, irritable bowel, you can have a lot of uh, temperature regulations, thyroid problems and things like that. So that's why there's a tremendous variability there. The major things to look for that I see is regression. Well, regression, either secondary to MMR or DTAPT and uh, some kind of infectious event, or some stress event, uh, move, um, hurricane, divorce, separation, um, all of a sudden the child regressed. And we're not talking about, you know, the children, they sometimes regress, they go up and down during normal development. But some very clear example is uh, when they start walking, they kind of are lower in their speech. And, and that kind of happens, but I'm talking more about if the child was doing normally and then regressed after a certain event, either it's infection or vaccines or something else, and then it progr and he started slowly progressing. So that kind of waxing and waning, um, either energy levels or developmental levels, easy fatigability, multiple distinct organs involved that are unexplained by other etiologies. And there are uh, blood work in addition to the chromosomal oligoarray, the microarray. Um, I'm also adding routinely things like lactic pyruvic acid, plasma amino acids, organic acids, and things like that, because that shows me indirectly mitochondrial function. And I kind of just told you that all mitochondrial diseases are severe, and that's not true. I have 72-year-old, I have 68-year-old, I have 45-year-old that I treat with mitochondrial uh, disease. So they can present at any time. It really depends what your combination of bad mitochondria are and where they, they, they sit. If they sit only in skeletal muscle, you're just going to have easy fatigability and you're not going to be able to uh, exercise too well. Okay? But if they're in the brain, depending on where in the brain, if they are subcortically in the basal ganglia in the brain stem, then you're going to have seizures, you're going to have uh, career form movement and, and uh, really poor development. If they're in the cerebral hemispheres, you may be up and out and walking around, but you can have speech delay, you can have cognitive delay, and things like that. So there's a lot of variation. The most important part about the treatment with mitochondria, you can make a huge difference, a huge difference when it comes to the treatment if you follow the plan. It's not an easy plan. If I told you it's an easy plan and you can make a huge difference, you wouldn't believe me. But um, very important is constant caloric intake. And what I mean by that is eat either full meals or uh, healthy snacks uh, no more than three, four hours apart. They can't starve. They can't fast because that breaks down your body. It causes catabolism. Fat and muscle gets broken down. Energy is sapped from mitochondria, and your brain can regress in that particular day, or the child is just going to be very tired and exhausted towards the end of the day. So what we do is, with a dietitian, we manage 
it's not so much as what kind of foods, it's that you have to eat at uniformly so you don't have, don't let your body starve, including the nighttime. Uh, we would add, for example, a, a tablespoon of cornstarch before bedtime so that that set in the stomach released glucose during the night while they were not eating, and that would provide energy, decrease the breakdown of the body. And then uh, there is avoidance of fasting, dehydration, and sickness. And then um, physical occupational therapy. So a lot of these things are in addition to what already is done um, for the children with autism. And then the vitamin cocktail. This is uh, an uh, exercise guide for mitochondrial myopathy. Uh, and this is for um, you know, just generalized mitochondrial patients. And believe me, all of us have bad mitochondria. Some of us are more easily fatigable than others. This is the special guide. You can find it on the website um, of this metabolic disease clinic in Vancouver. There's a great um, researcher there who sees mitochondrial patients, and he does elegant experiments and just shows how much exercise plays a role in uh, just the well-being of mitochondria, but mitochondrial disease itself. If you have bad mitochondria, what happens is when you exercise them properly, the bad mitochondria are going away and are replaced with the good mitochondria. And then, in addition to that, there's endorphins that are natural opioids and then uh, brain stimulators and things like that. So um, I treat usually with CoQ10, ubiquinol, which I follow the leukocyte level, and um, other, um, other vitamins there. So I, I currently treat 214 patients, and kind of every day it goes going up. And for at least three months, usually, I give them uh, the time. And what I, this 115 significant benefits, it's probably about 70% of the patients who do have um, some benefit and very few um, adverse effects. So improved muscle tone and strength, decreased fatigability, need for day naps. Some of my patients have five-hour naps at the age of five, which is really abnormal. That's because they have very little energy. Improved level of alertness, improved response to PT, OT, and the cognitive linguistic abilities. And that may not necessarily mean that a verbal child will start talking, but that may mean that a verbal child will become more vocal, will use more jargoning, will be more alert, and will be more engaged and understand more. So, uh, and sometimes we do have an increased number of words used. And then uh, the only thing that I have is insomnia and anxious behavior, and that sometimes is overstimulation. This, this vitamins, they stimulate mitochondria. That's what they do. Um, and they're, they're natural. They're in all our foods. We're just giving them an extra dose. And that's easily changed, easily resolved by changing the dose. So just a couple of uh, patients. Uh, this is a nine-year-old. Um, he had autism and more like autistic spectrum disorder, but uh, the mental delay, he had history of the mental delay and ADHD regression. He had a history of regression, and he actually had muscle biopsy, um, which showed mitochondrial problem. And uh, when I started treating him with vitamins, he got off of the, he, he was on Tanex and Ritalin, and he got off of, the, uh, off, off of that, and then energies increased, and he's actually in an exercise program losing weight. This these two siblings, three and five-year-olds, the, the lower one, the five-year-old, had a more severe autism, also had the mental delays, and they had a mother affected as well. Um, she was not autistic, but she had um, generalized weakness and easy fatigability and also had intermittent pain that would come and go that's characteristic of mitochondrial. This is what's called sympathetic pain because of the autonomic nervous system dysfunction. But uh, language and behavior improved. I'm sorry that I'm going so fast. So this is a girl that was really rewarding because she could just she was falling asleep. All four times that I saw her before I put her on vitamins, she would fall asleep and she would sleep for five hours during the daytime. And she did have complex three mitochondrial deficiency. 
And she really just now requires only one hour nap, and uh, she's in a regular class. You know, and uh, her social skills improved. I mean, she started, she, she was talking to me. She never talked to me before. She started talking to me. She's looking in the eyes. So uh, those are the things that you can change. And this was in a matter of uh, two months. And do you find any um, changes to the autistic or intelligence in terms of like the Certainly, certainly, because um, repetitive behaviors and stimming behaviors come mainly from the fact that the child can't express himself. So if the language is limited and if there's, a, there's also when there's a cognitive impairment, the child literally doesn't know what else to do and he just starts something stimming that, that um, calms him down. When you uh, do the therapy with the diet, exercise, and, um, and vitamins, the, if the expressive language and receptive language improve and cognitive abilities improve, that decreases repetitive behaviors. Exactly. That's exactly right. And that's why a lot of kids that I see, I don't believe have autism because they just have some cognitive impairment. And because of that, they have repetitive behaviors that people attribute to autism. And the longer they go... Uh, either in therapies or in treatment, then they go away, and then they're pronounced cured. And then when um, I hear some, some, I remember one therapist came and gave a lecture at our institution, and she said, "Well, don't just you know tell everybody that there is no cure for autism." And and I uh, raised my arm. I said, "You know what? Um, I just don't think that's true. You know, because if you take strict." Definition of autism that used to be 20 years ago. There's no cure for those, but maybe there will be, but not now. But there's so many children who are on spectrum everywhere. PDD, uh, ASD, they are just, I don't think that there's no cure. I mean, they are right in front of my eyes. They improve and they are not autistic anymore. It's just that they did not probably get that they were not meeting the criteria, the real strict criteria that we used to operate on. So, um, but that's been my experience. So this is a boy had pretty much similar symptoms, and this is what parent, the, the mother, wrote to me. Hardly takes naps at school anymore, but we just take them at the age of four. ABA therapist reported that social skills improved. OT reported that his tone and endurance improved. Sentences have three to five words, whereas before he would only use two. So that's typical when the child has some language, his language improves. If the child had no language and he is like, let's say, five and above, it's harder. And I'm still working with those kids. But um, for them, um, for, for now, what I'm able to achieve more is um, more level of alertness, more level of understanding, more jargoning and the words that perhaps only, only parents can understand, um, but others can. And this is the child who had uh, IQ of 20. It's a very severe uh, range. And he also had history of regression and seizures. Um, and uh, this is just kind of a paragraph uh, that the mother wrote, nothing but praise for his performance at school. That's after the vitamins and the program that we do. Uh, following directions, not falling out of his chair, or flopping on the floor like he did three months ago. He's happier, attempts to imitate his peers. He uses one-word responses. Um, they kept saying over and over, he's doing great. The only change is the vitamins. He even um, rode in the front of the seat of the car on the way to school and did not attempt to press buttons or open the door. It's the first time Last night he said bed and pointed to the bedroom. He's never been able to express his need verbally like that. I don't have to tell you how much importance it plays for the uh, parents and for healthcare providers like me. Um, it's, uh, whenever there is more interaction, it's always going to bring uh, fruits down the line. We're not necessarily aiming for cure for these kinds of patients. What we're aiming for is for them to have more life skills and for them to be able to communicate with us more and show us more of the... So this is just another girl. You can see how I could not get her 
uh, to take the picture, and then I could get the picture just like that, and she had much better attention span and better eye contact. And this is another child that you can kind of see. He's become much happier and more energetic. Let me just show you this real quick. Playing kind of thing. It's not playing evenly, unfortunately. I would have played better on my computer. I apologize. But, um, if you could just look at the motion. He's like four. He's got short stature. You could see that you know, he can't walk. And he's got um, hypotonia, or low muscle tone. It kind of just sags on you. This is another patient. Oh, no, wait, 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 wait. This is how she was before she came. It was a girl with a uh, mitochondrial disease. That is like after two months. So she was able to be more vocal. She was a verbal, but um, and she smiles more. She laughs more. She's they like they never seen her laugh like this. So it just can make a difference in in the patients like these. With overall level of interaction, you could see that the strength has improved. something right I'll just kind of go through real quick everything this is just a one slide that is a summary slide And this is just for how you probably feel, all of you right now. <laughs> so, uh, genetic plays, uh, genetics plays a, an important role in the etiology of autism. Uh, chromosomal single gene and metabolic causes are the ones to 
blame, and as we've discussed, it is a predisposition most of the times that we're talking about. Um, there's a lot of mitochondrial patients that don't have autism. It's all about you have kind of a hit from one side, which is a poor energy production, and then hit from the other side that uh, can give you autistic features. But what I've found, and especially mitochondrial diseases, they can wax and wane, but they can become asymptomatic and um, act typically, and that's what, that's what I have. So it's important to at least rule those out or to consider those because they can, the, the treatment um, efficacy can increase. So and prevention and counseling on recurrence risks and appropriate treatment. I apologize, there was too many um, concepts and uh, thank you for sticking around. <laughs>